I open the meeting at 7.01? You can. All righty. And the first order of business is reorganization, I believe. All right, hands off to me. So starting with reorganization, I'm looking for nominations for chair. I'm gonna nominate Elaine again. I'm happy to do it again. Thank you. Do I have second. a second? Yeah. Me. Yes. Yeah. Right. Any other nominations? Move Hearing the nominations. Be nominations. Closed. You close motion to close nominations. Yeah. Do I'll the public it. nominations. <laughs> so. All those in favor of waiting for chair? Aye. Yeah. Elaine, Michael, Aye. Ashley. Ashley's still muted. We haven't, heard, we haven't heard from Ashley. She's here, but I haven't heard from her yet. Phil? Yes. And then Denise? Yes. All right. So I got 401. All righty. All yours, Dr. Campbell. Okay. Can we have a nomination for vice chair, please? Isn't that Michael? I'm, ha I'm happy to nominate Michael. <laughs> Where is vice Not chair? Me. <laughs> Somebody second, Michael? Second. I can do it again. All righty. All in, oh, do we have to roll call? Uh, you do. All right, Phil? Yes. Okay. Denise? Yes. Myself? Yes. Michael? Yes. Ashley? She's unmuted now. Ashley, is that a yes? She's still here, but not vocal. Nod your head, Ashley. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, this is my second meeting, so I'm gonna be a little bit um, silly. Sorry. Yeah, no problem. All righty. Well, it's unanimous. We'll take it as unanimous. And then we need secretary. Is that right? Even though that's Kristen correct. always takes the notes, I think that's currently. Is that currently Phil? It's currently Ashley. Uh, Ashley. Ashley. Okay. Ashley. Ashley's done a funny job. Ashley, Ashley wants to do it again. There you go. I think you guys right. did this through last time as well. <laughs> I think not speaking. So you made her do it. We're going to have her do it again. I'll nominate yeah. Ashley. I'll second it. All right. I'll second Ashley. <laughs> okay. Uh, Phil? Yes. Michael? Yes. Denise? Yes. Ashley? We're going to take that as yes. And myself? Yes. All right. Unanimous. And then what's next is. Uh, do we have a treasurer? No. Do we? Um, it is, let me peek. I'm going between two screens. So the next one is going to be uh, the Union 38 representatives. Currently, it's Michael Merritt, Elaine, and Phil. You will point these now, Elaine. Okay. Or is everybody happy to do it again? Unless yes. Denise wants to be on it. No, I'm fine. Just being on Conway. All righty. All right, I'll do that. So yeah. I appoint Michael, myself, and Phil, Union 38. Um, and then you're also, right now, also the Frontier representative currently is Phil. Phil, you still want to be a glutton for punishment? Uh, I guess, yeah. <laughs> uh, all righty. Yes. Sounds good. Phil, you're it. I thought Ashley was, too. Ashley's the Ashley. at large. Oh, okay. The elected, the elected frontier rep. Okay. Okay. There you go. And then the collaborative representatives currently, Michael. Michael. I was I curious if if anybody else wanted to uh, have a turn at it. Uh, it's a valuable experience. It is a commitment where every other month. Uh, there's about a two and a half hour meeting. So it's like take two school committee meetings and put them back to back because it's all, every other month. Um, but it's an amazing crew of people at the collaborative. Um, it is very interesting. And it really gives, 
it really gives you a lot of insight into what's going on um, kind of across all of Western Massachusetts in terms of supporting the entire public school education. What's the timing of those meetings? Say that again? What is the timing of the meetings? Are they during the day, weekday? No, they're at, they're at night. Um, they've been I'm trying to remember the last time. It's like a 6 to 8.30 or 9 o'clock or something like that. So it's, it is a pretty long meeting. The good um, news is it's remote right now, so you don't have to go down and <laughs> have to do right. the dinner thing and make a full evening of it. <laughs> Were you going right, down yeah, to Northampton um, before, Michael? Is it Northampton? When it's when it's in person, they alternate between the the collaborative building in Northampton and um, the transportation center up in Greenfield. Um, and both times they uh, serve a a really nice uh, kind of catered food area that uh, you can get dinner that way. So yeah, I've, now that it's been remote, I've been missing out on dinner. But <laughs> um, it's I, I would say at some point in every committee person's life, it's worth uh, taking on the role because you really do learn a lot about public education in a more broad, like a in terms of like all of Western Mass. Uh, and what's happening in supporting students that are some of the most vulnerable students. So. Michael, that sounds like a role I can take. Okay. Cool. But you're gonna, but you're gonna owe her dinner that she doesn't get for the year there's <laughs> yeah. no dinner, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a good I deal. mean, there's um, there'll be an orientation meeting uh, that they'll invite you to that takes place like the first 30 minutes prior to the meeting starting. So it's like at five or 5.30 or something. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's a really interesting experience. So if you're willing to take it on, um, I'm happy to support you. Cool. Denise is our collaborative rep. That sounds great. And it is, I've done it several times, many years, and it's a useful experience. I'm glad to do that. Awesome. Cool. The last one, Elaine, is the uh, negotiations team. Currently, it's you and Phil. Um, it's not a negotiation year, but you never know when the team has to come together if we have to do any other issues with all the. I mean, we have an MOA we're going to vote tonight that's really going to set up this year, but you never know when we have to take the mothballs out. But it's not a it's not a big year for that committee. I feel like we've had so much fun on that committee on the last year that Phil and I just need to keep doing it again. <laughs> Man, did we spend a lot of time together, but anyway, if everybody else is okay with that, we'll just keep rolling. That works here. I'm okay if Phil and Elaine continue. All right. Sounds good. All righty. Your, your next agenda item is to review and approve the minutes of August 19th, 2020. I was not at that meeting, but could I have a motion to approve them? Yeah, they look fine. Second. I'll, I'll make. I'll okay. second it. Uh, okay. Um, Phil. Yes. Michael. Yes. Denise. Yes. Ashley. Yes. All righty, and. Um, I think I can vote. I think we cleared that up at one point, or should I abstain? I can vote, right? You can vote if you believe the minutes to be true and accurate. All right, I will vote. I will agree. Yes. All righty, next order of business. It's unanimous. Statements and signing of Yep, Shelly sent them along. Hope everybody reviewed them. Yep, I shared the two financial reports for general fund and school choice electronically. And also a quick little snapshot for Conway Grammar School. Um, there's not a whole lot to report on tonight. I'm getting a lot of feedback. Does anyone else hear that? Maybe it's I do. No. Oh, do you have your mic on? 
Okay, try again. So there were 12 warrants totaling $45,574.43 that were reviewed and signed electronically since the last meeting. Um, I hope that process is going well. If at any point you want to talk about the process, please let me know. Um, I'm happy to take questions about individual line items on the expense reports that I shared if you have them. Um, I don't have a, much to update you on. Uh, you will see some COVID related expenses that are on the school choice report as well as the general fund expense report. We set those up prior to getting the grant funding. So I'm looking to reallocate some of that once we um, are done spending and we'll move things back to where they need to be. Um, but just to get the orders in, we did put them on the school choice accounts. Uh, the most significant COVID related expenses to date have been HVAC and ventilation repairs. Yeah. Uh, general building and custodial supplies and PPE and nursing supplies. Nothing extraordinary, nothing that I'm concerned about as far as that goes, but just wanna, wanted you to know that that's what we've spent most of the COVID money on so far. Um, and then Kristen and I are in conversation regularly about staffing needs given the educational model that we have this year. Um, there was a discussion, you know, uh, before we decided on the model, what the different costs would be associated with the different models. Um, we obviously didn't use that as the driving factor to make the decision, but there certainly was question of is hybrid gonna cost us more? Is hybrid gonna have savings? Is remote gonna have savings? Um, and I'm learning quickly at this point that the hybrid model certainly doesn't present an opportunity for a lot of savings. Um, some of the concerns relate to staffing to make sure that we have adequate coverage in the building as well as remotely to meet the needs of both populations. Um, we also have some staff who have accommodations to work remotely. Uh, due to the coronavirus, or we made some exceptions for staff to work remotely. Um, so that caused a little bit of hardship uh, financially. However, it's nothing to be concerned about this at this point. Kristen is very conservative and she is doing what she can to use the resources that she has. But I did want to put it on your radar that we are continuously reviewing staffing needs and that there may be a need to add additional staffing, especially when it comes to substitute coverage. So nursing coverage, teaching coverage, and custodial coverage is all an area of concern. Um, in a small school, if we have a single custodian out for any length of time, it is problematic. And finding a sub is the first problem, and then paying the sub is the second problem. Um, and that's across the board with teaching and nursing staff. So just things that I want to put on your radar, nothing that I think we have to get into great detail about, but just wanted you to be um, familiar with some of the things that Kristen and I and Darius are in conversation about. Uh, so the last piece before I wrap up is the school lunch program. Um, I, I'm happy to report that Conway is in really great shape comparatively to some of the other schools in our district. Unfortunately, some of the other schools are really struggling with um, certain things like early childhood and special education um, because those are tuition driven programs and they have wages going out. So in Conway, the one program that is of area of concern right now is the school lunch program. And we had talked about this um, previously. You all know the history here. The program has never made a, a great deal of money. Um, this year, we, we ended fiscal year 20 with a potential deficit. We moved some wages around so that that didn't happen. We're going to have to do the same thing in 21. Right now, we're looking at the funds available of almost $7,000 with roughly $23,000 in wages currently to be paid. So the thing with the wages is we need to assess what's going to happen with the lunch program, how many kids are going to eat breakfast and lunch at school um, because the USDA did extend the free lunch and free breakfast for all families and students, um, which is great. Our community needs that, but it also means that we don't have revenue coming in from students buying lunch and the government reimbursement is less than what our lunches would, would cost. So we need to give it a good six, eight weeks, I think, once kids are back in the building and see what we're doing for pickup of lunches and see what we're serving for lunches. And then I can come up with some estimates on what I think we're gonna make from 
government reimbursement. Uh, the goal is at a minimum food costs that we're covering our food costs with that reimbursement. Um, but it is likely that salaries and wages, we are going to have to come up with an another avenue to pay that staff. Um, or the other option is to reduce staffing. But at this point, we're not making that move. Um, we need our staff in the building right now to be prepping and planning and then to get through this first chunk of school. And then we'll go from there and see how things are once we have a better idea of how many meals we're actually serving. So no action to be taken right now. Can I ask you a question, Shelley? Yep, of course. Um, I know that we've been made food, made meals available this whole time remotely, right? Yep. So does that generate any any revenue for reimbursement um, currently? It does. Yeah, we did get some reimbursement, and we still were ending the year with a deficit. So the the school lunch program just has not been overly healthy and. Um, you know, Mary and I are in close conversation about what that looks like and how we get through this year and make the most of it. The reimbursement is only on meals served. So I don't know off of the top of my head if, you know, are we not serving enough meals? Are we ordering more food than we need? Um, the program is that it's free for all children under 18. So one of the other things that we faced is that family members who may not be, you know, siblings, things like that, who may not be um, Conway grammar school students, they could also get breakfast and lunch. So, you know, there's certainly some challenge with challenges with it financially, even though it's really good for our community. So it's something we're just going to have to assess. Short answer, yes, Michael, we'll, we'll get some government reimbursement. He showed <laughs> you on, a, on a larger scale, but are we a unique community? How many communities do you think across Massachusetts are getting the, the adverse effects? So it's great that the USDA stepped forward and everybody gets free lunch, but we actually have to pay more as a district in order to offset that cost. In you know, in your conversations just around is is that, you know, or in your, even on your list serve, is that happening across the state? Or are we we are one of those communities that we just don't have enough free and loose lunch to offset that to begin with? Because I mean it's affecting not just Conway, it's affecting all of our all of our schools this way, folks. So I it just I didn't bring this up at the last meeting. Yeah, I don't know. That is a really good question. I certainly can ask in my next um, regional business managers meeting um, to see what what's happening. But I imagine it's like you're describing. You know, we know that Conway's population is um, on the higher end of the well, according to the state, right? <laughs> on the higher end of the income scale, and so that's why we don't get as much Chapter 70 either, right? So. We don't have a lot of free and reduced lunches. It's really we're we're kind of in a in a way giving away some of the food. I imagine larger cities, Springfield, Chicopee, those kind of places. You know, they're not having the same issue necessarily that we are. Yeah. So an another uh, question for you, Kelly. Um, so first of all, you know, the thing that's so unfair about the way that they calculate that last bit that you were talking about is that in Conway, the the, uh, the numbers are skewed by the just the presence of six families, six households skew our numbers. We're, we're a small enough community that six households can skew our numbers um, and make them unrepresentative of the, 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 uh, the other, whatever, 890 households that, that are, you know, so, so we're not, we're not as wealthy as they say we are, but it's just six, six families among us are, but the rest of us are not. Um, the, so the, the other thing is that, um, you know, when, when I hear the, the way that our school lunch program is, is described and, and how there's this, these built in assumptions that it should be pulling its own weight. I've long, I, I've, I've always sort of argued that those are unfair because when, when you look at the whole history of the school lunch program, if, if the federal government reimbursement just tracked inflation, from the time that, that school lunch programs were established in the mid 70s, the, the amount of reimbursement per meal would be like $9, I think they said, and $9 and something. And so, you know, the, the reason that it's so bad is because the federal government has not kept its faith with this program as they had promised when it was started. And, um, you know, the, that it's kind of unreasonable to have expectations that it will break even that it's just, 
that these are money losers and these will always be money losers until the powers that be play fair. Um, and yet, um, so like I, 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 that's even on a good year and, and this is not a good year for that. But so, you know, I, uh, I, yeah, I, 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 what's that? Sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, I, I agree with you to some degree. You know, I, I do think that it, it's a tough, program to be a moneymaker or to even carry its own weight, as you're saying. Um, and if that's the position that the school committee wants to take, we can certainly look at that and recognize that we're not expecting the salaries of the cafeteria staff to be paid out of there. And how are we going to pay for them properly in future years? So it's definitely Shelley, when we charge that $2 and 50 cents a meal, are we just breaking even? It depends on how are we even breaking even? Are we able to pay the staff? Because I don't know. Are we able to like when so when we have revenue coming in from parents, are we able to break even? Is that the typical? So uh, this is only my first year really working with this program. But what I know of history of this and what I inherited last year is that the program has not had a good history and has not broke even in years that it has ended several years with negative balances. And is that because we're not getting the parents because we have bills outstanding or because we're not charging enough or do we have a sense of why it's kind of a it's a mixture it's a mixture yeah. of how many people are buying hot lunch versus how many we're getting free and reduced on those hot lunches oh. um, and then your cost per hot lunch so the more popular items you sell more but it costs more you know th those kind of and then we do add some outstanding bills as well that people didn't pay off their bills at the end. So it's a kind of a combination of all three of those factors, um, you know, because, you know, you have, and also you have a small population. So you're, 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 you know, if you get 10 people who don't buy lunch for a week because they decide to bring their lunch for a week and it's a cool thing to do for a while, um, it, affects the, it affects the overall bunch. The bunch. food costs are so high. It's, it's hard to believe that we can charge $2 and 50 cents, you know. Well, and, and Mary does a good job at trying to take advantage of whatever is reduced rate through the government. There's even some things that we get for free. Um, there's also really strict guidelines, not that we don't want to serve good food, but there's really strict guidelines, way strict, way more strict than I anticipated as to what we can serve and how many things of each item you have to have a grain a fruit a vegetable you know so there has to be enough variety so i think she tries to be creative and keep food costs down as much as she can but you know it's certainly a challenge and and none of the schools you know nobody is making an extraordinary amount of money in their school lunch program that's not the point of the school lunch program anyway um, but the goal at, at most of the schools is to at least fund your food costs little bit of overhead things like, you know, repairs and stuff like that, and then your salaries and wages. But, you know, Conway, that's just not been realistic. Once they took ice cream away, that was the downfall of the school lunch program. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. That was the end. It was already struggling, but that just put the nail in the coffin, <laughs> at least and, according and to we, my son. And we have in the past decided not to sue people that we otherwise could have extracted money from had we sued them. Um, I remember participating in several votes of that nature. So I, I mean, I'm talking about parents that would have owed us money. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. All righty. Anything else in the financial report? So, so just another thing just coming up, are, are, are we going to be seeing, going to be seeing savings on the transportation um, end of things and, is there a sense of how much savings we are going to be seeing? Right now, we're, we're uh, Shelly and I are negotiating that right now. Um, we met with our attorney this morning to review the, the Gripco contract and the, the, the change in the contract. Right now, it's very, just to kind of give you an overview, it's very difficult because we have to prepare for busing that allows about um, 22 students per bus. Okay, because you have to do every other seat, staggered seating according to the um, the, the recommendations. Um, on top of that, we also are concerned that we are going to have um, increased ridership as the year goes on. And so having to be able to prepare to be able to add buses to the bus lines 
after we reduce them and moving that forward as well. So that's one of the things that we're dealing with moving forward right now. Um, and so we, we don't have a full contract yet, but when we do, um, I'll be bringing it back. It should have it probably early next week. Right now, we again, we discuss it with the attorneys, um, the attorney this morning rather, and he's gonna go through and put some language together. I thought I had heard that in Conway, we didn't have many students that were going to be taking the bus. Is that true? That's true, but your mileage is huge. Oh. So in order to have a bus from one end of town to go to the other end of town, it's a 45 minute trip. Okay. So <laughs> it becomes a big issue. And so, um, you know, the number of riders from one end of town to the other end of town, they still need to have two runs, even though the number of ridership may be 10 on each bus, let's say. You know, it's still not a full, you could probably do it on one bus, but it would be an hour and a half, you know, cycle to go through and pick everybody up. So that's the, so you look at you jump in. Well, and the split schedule, right? So there's certain kids Monday, Thursday, and there's different kids Tuesday, Friday. So you still have to run your bus all four days, even though the number of kids is small on those buses. So, you know, that's one of those things I was saying that, oh, we thought hybrid model, we're gonna have some savings. And in the end, it, it's turning out, we're not really seeing that as much. So it's complicated. So Phil, I will say looking at the preliminary things, it's not a huge bailout because, you know what I mean? There may be the, you know, and, and the other side is we could save money if we have an awful COVID experience. You know what I mean? Because the buses won't be running, which means awful things are happening in, in, in our community overall with COVID. You know what I mean? If things run great in our county, we have the numbers we had last week projected and moving forward, then we're going to spend more on transportation. That's a good thing. You know what I mean? So it's kind of like one of these, you know, um, which means we'll spend our budget what we budgeted for transportation. So it's not like we're going to be spending more. It's just we won't have savings. It's kind of a, mess, it's a messed up idea. Like we have savings because you know, bad things are happening in our community where we can't bring our kids to school, you know, that's, which is kind of crazy. <laughs> so, but yeah, we, we do, we've been talking about it in that way as well. So. Interesting. All right. Thanks. Let's see, Darius, um, Amanda joined the meeting. I, I've never. We're, I'm going to introduce her in a moment. Yo, like, who's this face? Awesome. What are you doing here? Who let her in? Yeah. <laughs> she she's not zoom bombing us. I'll tell you that. Um, if it's kept in mind, I could skip ahead to um, Amanda's portion on the schedule on our agenda. If you may I do it, Elaine? Yes. Right. Yes. So Amanda is here. Um, she's part of our anti-racism and equality committee. Um, and I sent you all the mission statement and goals, and I was giving you an update today. And Amanda um, has volunteered to come on and kind of give a. Um, she's we've hired her as a. As a consultant, um, Amanda is a graduate of Frontier 2013, Sunderland graduate, whatever you made up, 2007, you think you estimated. I don't wanna take away your your, your, your punchlines, um, but she'll, she's gonna give a little overview um, about what the committee's work is doing, where we're at at this point in time, um, and then answer any questions as well. So um, I thought it'd be great to, we thought it'd be great that she'd be here. So Amanda, you wanna talk a little bit about what's going on? Yeah, hello everybody. I confirmed with my mom it's 07 for Sunderland <laughs> a, a while ago. Um, <laughs> um, but hello everyone, it's good to be with you this evening. So my name's Amanda. I am um, helping out the district and frontier with thinking about issues of race and equity. Um, I realized I did, I was talking at the Sunderland meeting and I just jumped into what we're doing and I didn't say anything about myself and someone unmuted at the end and asked like, who are you? So I'm gonna not make that same mistake twice. And I'm gonna start with um, <laughs> what I'm doing and how I came to be in this role. Um, so after Frontier, I went on to college and I studied racial inequality. That was, my focus field that was, so this is sort of my wheelhouse, my area of expertise. Um, and how I came to be in this role is a little haphazard and wasn't particularly expected, um, but I was, I played a small role in putting together the alumni letter that was signed by hundreds of Frontier alumni 
Um, and I was, when I say small part, I should really underline that. Um, a lot of people did a lot of amazing work on that and they sent it to me and asked if I had anything to add. And I added a couple of things and then said, I would love to be a part of the follow-up for this. And I, uh, I got looped into email threads of, you know, planning the, first parts of the anti-racism and equity kind of district committee. Um, and then after that, I have been playing a larger role with the kind of subcommittees that are specifically working with the elementary schools. So those are the professional development committees and the curriculum committee. Um, and so I'm here today to just tell you guys about what that work has looked like and what it's going to look like through the end of this year. Um, so I'll start with the professional development. Professional development, we've had one kind of district-wide Union 38 um, session that sort of served as an introduction to anti-racism work. The goal of it was really calling everyone in to this conversation and saying why, even in a district that is predominantly white, this work is very necessary. And that I think went phenomenally well. I think there were a lot of people who were really moved and incredibly engaged and I could not have asked for anything more from that. I'm very overwhelmed honestly by how incredible of an experience this has been so far. Our second professional development session is tomorrow, which will serve as an introduction to two separate pathways that myself and the professional development committee have designed, um, which are eight sessions, each one hour long, that are kind of self-guided, that teachers, administrators, staff will go through in small groups. And so those two different pathways for professional development are white privilege and identity and history of racism. So teachers, staff will choose kind of which pathway they really want to immerse themselves in. And in groups of about 10, they're going to go through a pre-designed curriculum. Um, and that curriculum involves articles, podcasts, videos, discussion questions, and really thinking about what does this work look like in our lives in our classrooms in our schools in our communities um, and so that's sort of the professional development aspect and then for curriculum the elementary curriculum committee has three goals that they are working on the first two are concrete and the third is much broader and i'll go through them now um, so the first goal is to create common vocabulary and understanding of different terms, different aspects of anti-racist work. And the goal is so that teachers who are teaching, you know, kindergartners or teaching third graders or teaching sixth graders all have developmentally appropriate ways of approaching this work and bring it into their classrooms and answering questions that kids may have because the fact is that kids really start to identify and begin to pathologize racial difference at age four. And so even our youngest kids recognize racial difference and are starting to internalize some negative concepts. And so what the first goal is really trying to accomplish is making sure that when those conversations come up in the classroom, teachers have developmentally appropriate ways of addressing it with kids. Um, and then the second goal is book recommendations, five book recommendations per grade level that feature diverse protagonists, diverse plots, um, just kind of everything to really expose kids in our district to different kinds of people. And that's huge and it's a really natural way to bring up these conversations in the class because really not having these conversations does not mean that 
you know, nothing is happening. It means that we're just not talking about it and kids are sort of internalizing stuff. Um, and then the third goal is to really revamp curriculum so that it is more inclusive, more truthful, more honest historically. Um, just tells history, for example, from more different varied perspectives. Um, and that's an ongoing, much broader goal. And the goal of the first two points is really to help teachers have the foundation to really tackle that third. Um, yes, I know I did a lot of talking. If anyone has any questions, I am happy to answer them. So uh, I'll ask a question, Amanda. I'm Phil Cantor. Um, Hello. So, hey, um, in your opinion, are we doing enough? No. <laughs> cool. But... <laughs> Um, but, but but is it possible for us to be doing enough? It it that is that is exactly what I was going to address. No, and it is ne it's never going to be enough. This is a process, and I think that frankly, before the alumni letter, before I got involved with that, I was like, this district is beyond hope. There's no, I I was I was a little black girl in this district. And it was not easy. It really was not easy. Um, and I have been, like, I cannot emphasize this enough. I've been absolutely overwhelmed by the eagerness, by the hunger, by the drive, not only of the people who are on these committees, the teachers who are putting in so much time and energy into educating themselves and then developing curricula to help educate their colleagues, um, but also the teachers who have really risen to the challenge of having uncomfortable conversations, recognizing that, you know, what they have been doing isn't enough and are actively working to counter that. Um, so my first answer, my initial reaction was very pessimistic sounding, but it truly is not. And I'm, I don't think that any, I'm just thinking of friends from all over the U.S. who I'm telling them about the work that I'm doing with my old school district. And they're saying my school district isn't doing anything. That is the overwhelming response of what they're saying. So are we doing enough? We can always do more, um, but are we doing really good work? Yes, absolutely. And I'm thrilled to be a part of it. Yeah. Cool, cool, thanks. <laughs> Any other questions for Amanda? Just to comment that I'm super thankful that Amanda's uh, here. It's awesome that we have alumni coming back and supporting the district. So thank you, Amanda. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I will, in the chat, I will leave my email. If you have, I'm terrible at coming up with questions in the moment, personally. Um, so if anyone has any further you. questions, sure, I, I, I'll link my email. Or, but answer so, yours. <laughs> so the, the last, the last bit about the the real hard road to hoe, which is the the ongoing curriculum uh, aspects, the the much bigger part of it. Do do are, are we setting up the mechanisms to create that kind of long term change that, um, or that, that big broad base kind of change that you're in? I mean, that's that's something that, in my experience, when you institutional issues like that really require like a long-term commitment to stay after it. And um, so could, could you speak to that sort of institutional commitment to stay after it? Are you seeing that or are we creating that? I, wow, that's a fantastic question. You're not letting me off easy here. Well, no. <laughs> he never does, Amanda, he never does. <laughs> that's okay. Um, I think that my 
initial reaction, my gut reaction is actually yes. And I think that is because um, the professional development, the way it has been set up is incredibly intentional. There are a lot of hours being set aside explicitly for anti-racism work. And I think the most important part of that fact is that it's personal anti-racist work. It is, I think there's so much anti-racist curriculum out there that if you can educate yourself easily, but if you're not applying those learnings to yourself, it is, I, I don't want to say meaningless because that makes it sound so trivial, but if you're not applying the learnings to yourself, then it's not truly education. And I think the fact that we have set aside so much time for thinking about personal growth, development, positionality, if you walk into the classroom as you are, how does that impact what you are teaching, what you choose to teach, what you choose to leave out? All of that is essential. And once you kind of build that foundation for thinking about how you teach, what you teach, why you teach, how you can reach different groups of people by bringing in different stories and elements into your curriculum, I think that never disappears. That questioning of sources, that um, kind of looking for lost voices, that doesn't go away. And those are the skills we are building right now. And so I think that is the first step in creating institutional cultural shifts. Yeah. Cool. cool. And I just also wanna say that we built this committee as it's a community base. It's not just one person from one school that, you know, when they get tired, it ends. But I also, mm -hmm. I also, I flip it back around and say it's also school committees. If the school committee wants this to be a continued thing, you know, I'm gonna be putting it on the agenda but I also need your feedback and oversight as well. Is like, where are we with this? To continue inquiry, because you're the link to the public. And, and, and as I was saying in the other meeting, um, Frontier talked about, is there any training that they can get as school committee members as well that can help be applied to this? And so I'll be, I'm looking into that. So that people are interested in that, um, as well as we'll be having ongoing reports to school committee about what we're up to and, um, and you know, basically, and updating our policies, which obviously you guys will have to be voting on to make sure that the, not just that the language there, the legal language is there, but is the is our district's tone wanting to be there? Because we have a lot of the checkbox for legal language, but there's a lot of other policies that we're reading out there that really have a tone that talks about racism and um, what this what the community stands for um, in those policies and such, in handbooks and that kind of stuff. So we're going through that as well. So you do have a role in it. And um, so that also about how it carries forward. And I think, Philly, that question you brought about the institutional commitment, I think I think you brought up a good question to me because I think that's something I'll, I'll be bringing back to the, maybe Amanda, I'm telling Amanda to bring back to the committee because I think we really try to plan, how do we get this thing off the ground and get into the school year? We haven't thought about 20, year 22, you know, 2022 yet. And that might be where we have to kind of go after we get things going is what does this look like for next year and how do we keep this going? What's the next step? And it probably depends on what, how successful we are in step one, right? Before you build step two. So that's, you know. How do you define success in something like this? F fewer displays of Confederate flags? Change. Yeah. That would be a real nice start oh, yeah. though. <laughs> yeah. The lowest yeah. hanging fruit I would love. Uh. That's right, exactly. Yeah, well, I think. I, uh, yeah, sorry. Oh, oh go ahead, go ahead. Quick comment on cool. Darius, I, I was just thinking about how at the last MASC conference that we attended as school committee members, there's a uh, one of the programs is like a mission statement creation for school committees. Um, and I know the MS, MASC conference is going to look different this year, right? Not even sure if it's happening because of gathering restrictions, but um, I can imagine by you know, hopefully by a year from now, um, school committees will have support from the MASC uh, to help with mission statements and such like that. 
Yes, I imagine they would. And, you know, we're, we are looking at all those. I mean, I was on, I'm on the policy committee and we were, we were looking at some of the language and what it was missing and what was vacant in it. It's not like, it's not like the missions and stuff aren't, aren't good, but there's, there's stuff missing um, when you look at it through this lens. And so um, there's a lot of work there. Uh, and as we read through it, there's a lot of uh, better language that we could do in, in looking at handbooks and how we address things and where, um, and when you look through the again through this lens, there's there's things that are vacant that we you're, we're you know um, it's not that we allowed be you know purposely allowed behaviors, but we purposely did not also say that we were going to stop behaviors and, and certain that kind of thing. And so working on that language as well. So more to come on that. Well, thanks Amanda for joining us this evening, and we look forward to uh, more more change uh, yeah. along the way. So. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Um, I, will, I will pop my email um, in the chat. I have Great. a lot to say, especially about kind of how we measure success because I see that as my role. So awesome. I will um, look forward to further conversations. Thank you all for having me. Sounds Thank great. You, Thank you so much. Thank you. Awesome. All righty, Darius, what's next on our agenda? We're going to take a step back and go to update on school reopening. All righty. And I'm going to ask Kristen Gordon to, thanks, Amanda, um, uh, to buy the streets of the school. All right. Is there any public comment at all? There's no not, public here. There's no, no public here. No. However, we did ask for people to submit in writing. We did not get any in writing by... I think Donna checked at four o'clock today. It was the last check. We did not have anything at that point. I, I actually received something in writing from somebody. Okay. And um, he actually he actually wrote into the town clerk, uh, who wrote into the town accountant, who wrote into the town treasurer, who wrote into the town administrator, who wrote to me. Um, and he's trying to set up a sale. Uh, he, he's he's in the sales department of of a solar of a solar company, and he wants to work out a thing where he donates money for every resident that buys solar. Um, it donates money to the school. He's at, he's got a son, uh, a stepson in the school. Um, yes. Have you spoken Sister. about this? Um, I got a phone call um, from him, and um, I was I was going to return his call and tell him that. We, we don't do fundraisers for, you know, people's sort of private businesses like that, but I. So what I wanted to say is that there is a mechanism that we could do that if we wanted to, that this, that through the town, that the town can vote to accept gifts in a gift fund for the grammar school and that the town can hold that money for the grammar school to use as they see fit. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so the town wanted to do it, Phil. We get we get um, the issue with the schools just in general, um, just over the years, over the many years, is that someone might have a Tupperware business, and they'll say, if if we sell, if I sell Tupperware, you can get twenty percent of the profit, or if I, and it would be never ending if we open that kind of worm, a can of worms as a school anyway. But as a town, um, I mean, that's up to Darius. But as a school, we would be constantly getting those uh, requests. I could use new Tupperware. Um, Phil, I was not contacted, so I don't really know the parameters of what this is happening. But it is the, you know, going into the, the fine line between public and business and then promoting business through a public entity is the area where you have to just be careful. So but I, I, so I haven't been told, been, you know, shoot me the email on that. Right. He said to an email, if that's what I'm yeah. hearing. Yep. So this business would actually advertise their product by saying we're going to give money to the school. Right. Is yeah. that bad? I guess that's bad. I don't know. It seems like a conflict, a little bit. It seems a little weird, but I don't know. If, let, let's just say for the sake of argument, this, that you put restrictions on the use of the name and the use of the logo and the use of, the, and you just let somebody use the words in a sales pitch and then give us a check. Is that bad? Well, money's good, but. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know. Well, that becomes when you allow sponsorships in your schools. Yeah. So that becomes, um, you know, we can, 
it's a probably an item for agenda when we have agenda item when I can get then I can get the proper policies and that kind of stuff. But right. it is that one of those sense. things because I could say, um, hey, you know, for every for every quart of Jim Beam I sell, I'm going to you know give money to the the, the elementary school. And so is that is that something that the elementary school would be behind? You know what I mean? I'm just putting it out there as, yes. you know, you know, <laughs> yeah. you know, where it is, you know, where do the value is? I mean, money's money in some people's mind. Some people, other people would say, um, you have also have values of the school and the school's mission and, and can some of those things be counter? So. All right. So we'll table the conversation for now and right. uh, bring it right. up at another right. time and move on to where were we going next? We were going to update. Updating. Kristen was going to tell everything about Kristen. school. Yes. Update. So school school, school update. And if it's OK with you, I'll just hit highlights of the principal report and just do it all at once. So school update. We started with our 10 days of PD and teachers, the staff were very, very busy setting up, you know, doing professional development and setting up classrooms and getting Things organized for remote learning. Uh, Thursday and Friday were orientation days uh, for all students, and um, those went very well. You know, um, the kids were adorable. That's the best part of the job, right? Seeing the kids. Um, it's really hard starting the year seeing the kids on the screen. So yesterday was day one. I was really excited to see all a lot of the little kids dressed up and doing little their little boards. You know, little kindergarten for the first day of school and things like that. Um, it hasn't gone without hitches, but we are, or, or glitches, um, but we're working through those every day. So it's day two, and um, our participation has been really great. The attendance has been great. Um, we've hit some technology glitches, um, and we're working on those things as we go along. Um, but in terms of the kids' attendance and participation, kids are happy to be back at school. Um, very difficult to start the year remotely, as many of the um, staff are commenting. They're really excited to get the students back next Thursday. So the students will be remote this week. They'll be remote Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then they'll come back in their cohorts. A will come on Thursday. Cohort B will come on Friday, half days. And then the following Monday, Tuesday, cohort A and B half days. And then they'll start full days, uh, full cohorts, October 1st. So just as a quick update, 83% um, of our students are have chosen hybrid and 17% of our students have chosen remote. So we have a, a, a large number of students returning and I really do feel like we have put in the greatest safety me measures that we can for a school. I am really, really on the way over the side of um, very, very cautious. That's how we're going to go and that's how we're going to stay. And um, even to the point where I wasn't even allowing backpacks in, and then we had a big parent meeting and they all convinced me that they can bring backpacks. So I said, well, you can accuse me of being overly cautious anytime. That's actually a compliment. So that's okay. Um, so other than glitches with, with technology, we've had um, a good start. We're trying to catch the kids who have limited or no uh, internet access and inviting some of those kids back to school four days a week because we don't want the internet to be, um, internet issues to be, um, you know, be in the way of student learning. And I'll putting, be putting an email out to a few parents who we've seen some glitches with um, to, to sort of um, get names on that list, but we already have quite a few names on the list for that. Um, our pre-K students are back full time. They started on a Monday half day this whole week. They are adorable. You know, they're just little three, four year olds and they come and they're doing a great job with the mask. But most of their day, uh, much of their day is outside. Um, Sue has, you know, the classroom looks great. You know, we have 10 feet distance with kids. I mean, that, that's that program is really going very well right now. And our wing students. Um, 10 of our wing students started, 100% started back on Monday as well. And they'll be going half days this week. And they have a bigger room, so they're spaced very well. And um, they, uh, great two days, great two days. The parents are so appreciative and, and really happy to have the students back. So that's how our start is going. Um, I want you to know that um, I've talked to Tom Hutchinson and we have three tents up right now going for a fourth tent and the town has agreed to pay for those 
uh, tental rents, oh, tental rents. <laughs> I'm tired. I haven't been sleeping much. Rent tentals. No, stop it. Tent rentals. <laughs> Serious. I haven't gotten much sleep. Um, tent rentals uh, under COVID expenses. So that's really great. Um, Darius is going to talk about that. HVAC system, but GMRAG has been in the building working on that. Uh, in terms of transportation, we have about 25%, um, 24% of our students needing transportation. I want to give you a school choice update. Um, we had six students moving out of Conway Grammar School. Four were sixth graders who moved down to Frontier. One who moved out of town, we actually moved to the Berkshires, and one who had been school choicing from quite a distance in um, going into sixth grade and made a switch. So six out and 12 new school choice students in. So we're, we are we made out, we're in the positive um, in terms of school choice. Special education, we've spoken directly, I've actually spoken directly to all of our families who have children with special needs, children on IEPs. We've been creating schedules based on individual student needs um, and creating learning plans for those students that will go out this week. And I'm really pleased with the progress and the offerings that we we have made to families um, that have varying needs. So we're off to a really great start. Um, we're tired, we're really tired. Tired like we've never been tired before. Um, but seeing those little kids has been really worth it. You know, a lot of my teachers are saying, can we ask Darius to bring the kids back like, you know, tomorrow? Um, so we're ready. We have a great team back. Um, we have people working remotely and they're doing a great job. We have a great team in school. I'm really feeling very good about the year. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Hey, Kristen, you may have already sent something out or maybe not. Um, what about the 75% of the parents that are driving their kids in? Is there any kind of rotation in terms of drop off and pick up given the volume? Yeah. So you know what? I, we're, you know where the point I'm at right now, Denise, which is a good point, actually. I'm ready for the next day. <laughs> I'm literally ready for the next day. So, yes, Jim Carmichael was over um, talking with me today, and we're talking. <laughs> it is on my list, but I'm like, okay, as long as I'm ready for the next day, I'm really, I'm really in good shape. Yes. Yeah, so we're going to have a couple. We're going to start with staggered drop-off times um staggered pickup times but we don't want those to be too far apart like an 8 30 drop off and an 8 45 pickup i mean drop off and then a, a three and a 3 15 because we don't want the times to vary that greatly and also um jim was talking talking to jim and i'm going to talk to kenny a little bit about the traffic pattern because that that is a that is a pain i really we really have to have staff out there not let people get out of the cars pull up so when I was at my a former school when I was principal, our um, when parents dropped off, you were probably five cards deep and then you went to Route 8. And I got complaints from people going to work in Pittsfield from Adams and, you know, that they can't get through Adams at a certain time. And I wanted to say, well, go to work a little earlier and that'll be fine. But in any event, we had this great system and we're going to put it in place at Conway. Parent pulls up. Staff member opens the door, keeping their distance with their mask on. Say bye to mom. Say I love you. Bye, mom. Love you. Okay, out we go. Bye, Denise. Have a great day. So we're just going to do that same thing again this year. Same with pickup. You know, we're going to be much better with that. So that flow worked really re well at my former school. And again, we had a major, you know, Route 8, which was saw a lot of traffic go through. Um, and uh, um, it worked. It worked really well. So I'm hoping that we can have people go around, take the kids out, and there might be a lineup on part of the driveway, but not all the way down. So we're going to give that a try. Sounds good. I was just thinking, that's a lot of people. And you're not used to having, you know, that many people driving yeah. in and just, you never know. It just could be chaotic if it's, you Yeah, know. I think the first couple of days will be chaotic until we say, literally, open that back door Okay, let's go. Let's have a great day. You know, keeping our distance. Out comes the kid. I think within four or five days, people will sort of get that, you know, and they'll There's go a lot right of parents up, right like, that aren't used to driving their kids to school at all. So they have no experience with this. So they're used to just sending them on the bus. So yeah. you might have some of that, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. My only other question is the cold weather. What are we thinking about kids being outside in the cold? 
Oh my God, we had all the windows open today. It was freeze up, uh, freezing up in Conway today. So um, we have a, a that fundraiser that Carrie the Cigna was doing. It's, it was like it came to be close to four thousand dollars. I really think we're. I mean, I really think we're going to get blankets for kids and things like that. I mean, they're tough. They're Conway kids, but got blankets yeah. and layers and and um, and also remember that out, outside education isn't just about you know sitting in a reading group outside it's about exploring and taking hikes and and doing you know just a different type of education um so getting kids moving and getting around we have great we have great windows in our school too so you know i happen to be in second grade today and they had all the windows open and the door and there was just so and they have an, most classes all but one have an exterior door so they had all of that open and it was just breezy and really nice it was cold but it was breezy and really nice in there um and so we're gonna try to you know get kids out get them moving and um look it's gonna be interesting out today and they're like oh it's cold and i'm thinking oh you're I know. To be i think we're gonna use a lot of that money for like big fluffy blankets that we put kids names on and yeah. um you know just yeah i was cold in school today i was like okay we gotta dress in layers here you know but you know for all the um, kids that don't want to wear the jackets typically and stuff like that they're not gonna be able to get away with those things anymore they're gonna they're have to wear really stuff really really clothes, yeah so. yeah yeah and then Denise, so, you know what the other thing is there are kids that love to be outside even if it's cold you know some of those kids that i'm like put your jacket on I, I, you know, I said to one kid last year, I said, listen, you could take your jacket off only if I get a note from your parents. Like, by golly, didn't he bring a note in the next day? I said, Wait, you're making me nervous. I'm going to get some. But there are a lot of kids who love outside. So if we even if we have a 50-50 type of thing where, you know, some small groups are outside and the kids who like to be warm and they're inside. So um, we're going to figure that out because today I realized I'm like, oh, it's cold and kind of way today. <laughs> No more sixth grade boys in their shorts. <laughs> I think Clayton tried to wear shorts every day of the sixth grade. He almost succeeded. It's, it's a thing. And you know, pediatricians will tell you, even though I say it to kids all the time, they do not get sick by not wearing jackets and wearing shorts. <laughs> Bill? So, yeah, so Kristen, so the, the thing I always remember about the fall is that it, it, at the Conway Grammar is. How many teachers utilize the forest behind the the, the school for, for for lessons in the fall? And do, do we right now have safe access to the forest for the children? And what are we doing? So I, I, I have a role in this and I have no matter what you answer, I'm going to have comments about. So, so help me, please, because I got a letter after the tornado from. Um, oh, what is um, Allison Hunter part of? Uh, yeah, she's you a know, forester. For this. I got a letter that we could not use the, you know, the nature trail and everything because there are trees down from the tornado and it, and you know, it wasn't a safe area. We could not use it until they came for cleanup. And I've, I, I've inquired a couple of times, and we're just haven't been on the list for a clean cleanup. Our kids can't go back there. Yeah, it's it's not that bad. you can get around there. Um, yeah, but not when I get a letter like that. I don't, is that I don't something know. the public can help with? So, 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 uh, part of the thing is that, and and uh, you know, I, I don't know if you if you're all aware that there's been uh, the big big town meetings about uh, virtual meetings about the town forestry plans for for the for for that town forest behind the school, um, and many people bitterly complain that there was not safe access for the students currently to get back there. And, and I understand from speaking with uh, Bruce and from speaking with our highway boss that a safe route has been selected. Do you know about that? No. Our nature trail that the parents created, you know, the, and the teachers, and right. that, that's not safe. There's trees all down. But it's still from the tornadoes. Right. So, so this, so, and, and you know, I've, I've been just putting on my selectman hat, select board member hat. Um, the, the, uh, just, you know, I, I've been trying to really push on this because this is something that our highway boss has known about for many months, the need to, to get safe access for the kids to get out there, especially since 
the highway boss's placement of equipment in many locations has led to the loss of that safe access. Yeah, because um, we use that all the time before, all the I, time. I know. So, so, um, and I attempted to actually issue like an order to the, to, uh, and, and uh, to, that, that, that safe access be created. Um, and, and, and I was disappointed in the pushback that I received from our town administrator in this regard. But the, the long and the short of it is that um, the, there is an awareness that this is a highly desirable thing for this from, from the students. Um, but if, if I may, if you could make a place a phone call to the highway boss um, and just saying, look, you know, if you can get us access by the beginning of school or shortly thereafter, that would be a good thing. Um, so, but because I've been trying to do it um, from, from my end and, this is the unfortunate busy time of the year for road building and actual like road stuff, um, highway stuff. Um, but I thought I, that ticks were an issue at one point, and that's why it was, was kind of closed down. Ticks or so something. What were did Denise? What did you think was an issue? Ticks. No, Phil. The letter. I wish I had the letter in front of me. It, it not only talked about safety. It talked about endangered. What it was, was endangered it? salamanders or something, or frogs, yeah. right, or vernal pools, because it was a, there was a, well, there's two neighbors, and their, and their property abuts that field, and one of them is a real super, problem. She, well, they're both problems, but in just on different ends of the spectrum. One of them wants to save every sort of tick, caterpillar, butterfly creature that's back there, and the other one would walk up the hill. And uh, chain smoke and glare at the kids because but he would be yeah. on his but he would be on his property. Yeah. So the the boundary oh, to the back of it, yeah. I think he's he was. Gone. He's he's still there. I mean, he's still around. But but the town has uh, a right to be there, and I think Absolutely. I think I think he's chilled out considerably since then. Okay. Well, because the kids aren't in there anymore. When the kids were in there, but there was just... something. There was something about salamanders or vernal pools or some sort of thing that Allison had to write. Yeah, right. It wasn't just about the safety. It was about. It was about, it was about some animal that was being disturbed. There's yeah. no water up there. No, is that something the conservation committee would be involved in? I don't no, know. So, so this you're talking about like years ago, though. A few years ago. And I d no. just a, a, a recent Al, update. We went trying to find these animals in uh, in March to go see if they were back there. So it so was just just in the past couple of weeks. There was a, a big Zoom meeting with over eighty people in this town, including Allison, that all voted to that in the top ten things that the town is going to be putting money behind for the for that town forest. Like in that top ten was the use of students of the Conway Grammar School for Great. nature's, for their own nature's thing. And well, maybe that, she can, that, and she was part of that. She maybe she can write Kristen, maybe she can write Kristen a letter saying that it's all good. There's no salamanders and the kids can use it again. Yeah, they, still, they still have to clean up the trees in there. Jim, so yeah. can I have a, a couple clarifications here? Just who owns the land? What is the problem with the access? Listen, I, Conway's a metropolis compared to where I grew up in Worthington. Okay, so <laughs> access, if you had to step over a tree that has fallen, it's only if the trees are like dangling. That's the danger. I don't understand what's the, do we need to, and how much of a path do we need to create? And well, then the the bill, I think the fifth and sixth grade should have a curriculum about forest study and make a recommendation to the town about what they can do about that property back there. I mean, we can do a lot of different things, but so I guess what's, what's so the that, question here? It is the a tornado. Town the tornado it really destroyed it though. No, it knocked a few trees over. It's a, it's a woodland. Uh, it, it, it's have resilient. you been back it, there, it, Phil? What's that? Have you been I back there? Back, I go back there all the time. Aren't it's there lovely. trees hanging on to other trees though, that need to be cut down? That's what I was asking. Yeah, that's what I'm just asking. A, what is the danger? Just a it couple, but there's work. Trees, there's, trees. there's trail workarounds already that have been established around those. Um, the sort of you, know, you go around. I know around. just a couple, but, but I can't send those little kids out there when there's trees. <laughs> I'll go explore it sometime soon. 
Um, well, I'll go with the town's responsibility to clean this up. I think the, there was one or two that they were really worried about that have come down on their own accord since they were really worried about. Um, but but there there is like an eight, I think it's almost 100 acres. That's a town-owned forest. Um, and it, it and it's up to the town to continually decide what to do with it. And we're always in that process. And for instance, I just wrote and had just today received knowledge that got approved for a grant of $20,000 to do a feasibility study to get carbon credits for the town to get paid for not cutting the trees down in that little forest. Um, well, so, somebody's log in the other end of that forest. This is true. Right where the, right where the town border ends. Right okay. where the town. That's, I think that's yeah. coal, is that Cole's lumber or is Correct. that a... Yeah. So, Phil, we had a half a mile trail out there. And when I was there this summer, there were trees that, you you know, you might not notice at first glance, but they had fallen and they're holding on to another tree. They weren't down this summer. If they're down now, that's that I didn't know that. But that wasn't that wasn't the tone of Allison's letter wasn't about that was me about safety because I was like, it's just not safe back here. But the tone of Allison's letter was something like Ashley's talking about. It wasn't about, it was something else. I, I wish I have the file at school. I wish I had it with me. Um, I'll but, look into it. I'll call you, Phil. All right. So, and just to get back to answer the rest of Darius's question. So what, what has impeded access since the, um, is number one, the new highway facilities that have been created. And number two, the decision by the highway director to store all these old plows and like right. giant hunks of metal in right where the trail, right where the trail access used to be. Yes. Um, Isn't that a jungle so gym? A bunch of old yeah. plows yeah. climb over. Right. <laughs> I can't make right. jokes like that, Super 10. I mean, uh, of course, safety hazard. Right. And, and so, you know, um, and and the, 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 we I've received verbal promises that this stuff will be moved, that, that the safe access will be created to the satisfaction of all concern, because there's room enough within the town land to do so, um, but that it has not yet been done. And so that that's what I've been trying to sort of ascertain where the delay and what what the snafus really is. But. I see it's not on Kristen's end. <laughs> no. But the, the trail that the parents built, Phil, isn't that far back. It's right behind the playground. Yeah, but but then so it, it it's, runs. It's, a, it's, it's to the side of that. It's not the trails right. that we hike that go through lockheads at the back. It's but it, it, right at the, the back. It was a, a little the, loop right behind the playground that they could access from the playground. And the two that's of them the need to be connected. The two of them need the to be connected. They do, but I mean, the the immediate focus is they they could go right out behind the school and get right on that trail right there. And there's no equipment in the way of that, I don't think. Just the ones yeah. in the way back. It happens. Now, the equipment the new, would be on the playground then, Phil, if it was right. But the new back wall of the of the storage barn it really in, impacts with what you're talking about, though, and. There does need to be a little bit of a workaround from that. All right. We'll have to go take a look. We'll check it out. Yeah. All righty. Is that the end of your report, Kristen? Yes. Thank you. All righty. I'm glad we're off to a good year despite all the challenges you face. Yes. And I'm sure you're exhausted because it's, I know you work <laughs> and your staff work very hard at this. So we appreciate Thanks. that. Thanks, Elaine. Um, Darius, what's next? So the next thing on our agenda is we have a, a few policies to look at. The first one being um, public comment. So, you know, today I, I put in a procedure to have public comment being submitted in writing. Um, you're kind of the, you're four out of five committees into this discussion. So it'll kind of give you an update of where everybody else is at, which may help you in your decisions. Um, right now, um, people have voted this policy and asked me to go back and create, they voted this policy. So there's something in place um, to protect us as, you know, um, so we're, you know, we have a process for public comment um, while we create a, you know, looking at um, possibly having a recording line, um, 
well, let me let me review what the policy says first, and I think that may probably make it a little bit easier to understand where we're at. So basically, we're adding the the the, the language. Um, this is an event of a special or regular. It has been a special or regular meeting of the committee that is held remotely. Public comment must be submitted in writing at least 24 hours in advance to the chair of the school committee. During the remote meeting, public comments will be shown on the screen for viewing or read at the meeting, provided the comments are consistent with the rules and procedures detailed in this policy. So um, other committees felt like this is there's just not enough availability for public to make a comment because if it's submitted in writing well in advance and can we look at one, maybe a phone line where people can call and leave a message for a public comment that obviously could be screened. The other one was if people could um, be invited in to make a public comment and we can authenticate who they are. So I'm so on and so forth. I'm read This is my resident. And then we let that person in. Um, you know, right now, you know, Google Meet is supposed to come out with new protections and stuff in the next month or so. There's this big new release that everybody's waiting for from Google that may actually provide a lot of the protections that we need um, within a public meeting where we can shut people out and not let them back in and so on and so forth. Um, or stop people from public commenting without being recognized, that kind of stuff. Those are things that I believe the new Google Meet. So this might just be a short term fix anyways. Um, that's my hope. Uh, but so anyways, that's kind of where I'm at. The other committees voted this voted this moving forward. Um, actually, I was just left Sunderland and they actually got rid of the 24 hours and that said, um, because we I even checked it right up to four o'clock today, even though it was said 24 hours, which would have been yesterday. Um, the problem is, you know, I had Donna had a check and Donna had a check it from the road because she was not at, she had, a, you know, she was at, out this afternoon so she had to check it on the road in order to let me know so i could let elaine know if we had any public comments there's like a lot of like well it seems very easy it's just like another task on top of all the other tasks that i do five times so i mean there's a part of me that's like i, I do want some sort of streamlined system in it but i'm hoping that the google thing is coming but so anyway to summarize the other committees voted this into place for now but they've asked me requested that I go back and try to figure out how we can do an audio recording and possibly invite people in to make a comment if they show, they can let us know ahead of time they'd like to be invited and I can send them an invite that they can't share, um, which is, you know, another thing out there as well. So that's where the other committees are. You know, public comment is an important part of this committee's work when there is comment, <laughs> you know. <clears throat> Is it is it because of like 250 people showing up on meetings and kind of carrying the meeting away kind of thing? Or? Oh, no, Elaine, this had to do with the Zoom bomb. Oh, OK. Yeah. So the fact that we were unable to stop the pornography the other night and until we get those protections in place, um, you know, you know, the you know, the, the problem, you know, the police are dealing with it, but it wasn't a single person. It was multiple people in a coordinated effort. So which, you know they're going out there and they're just fi randomly finding these publicly posted meetings and they're just kind of picking the jump in on them. Um, Were so, they local or national? We don't, we don't believe that they're local. They certainly were adults, um, not, not high school kind of kids playing a prank. It was an adult. Um, and there were multiple members of them. That's why, um, the principals were having trouble, um, trying to get, blocking them from putting things up because they had multiple, they had up to four accounts going at the same time. And so anyways, I'm trying to, you know, obviously put something in place until we can get better security on that. And that's what we, you know, that's what I'm trying to do for the next meeting at least. And then maybe we'll have better technology by the third. So meeting. do you, you want us to vote this in the moment then? So, yeah, I mean, I'd like you to vote this in the moment and then also, you know, I'm going to come up with a, I'm going to try to come up with some sort of way of doing an audio recording so that those who can't write or that is a hampering for them to refer public comment can leave a can leave an audio recording. Um, and then we also could invite people. And I did invite the union in tonight. They apparently didn't um, send anybody, but I did invite, I sent them a, a link to join us tonight and I have for the other committee meetings as well so that there's members from our teachers here. They can be a part of the conversation as well. Um, so um, but, you know, I'm going to come up with those other things as well. But this is what we have in writing for tonight. So at least we have something to fall back on 
that you know we rest- you know we have an opportunity for public comment. We're not restricting that. And then I might be able to put a procedure that's more that allows more by next month. Does that make sense? I do, I do think uh, other school committees have a policy of having public comment submitted prior instead of having the public on there. I think. Um, yeah. So this might be this policy was lifted, but was given to me by the attorney that um, our neighboring districts are use. Amherst uses something similar. But they also have a phone line you can call in, and those are things, and that's been working successfully in that community. Hampshire Regional did something; they got Zoom bombed a couple months ago, and they um, they updated. Uh, they're actually on Zoom. Um, they updated to a, a written in advance policy, I think, which is this. Um, however, the other committees felt that this was too restrictive in a time where public comment should be um, encouraged, and they wanted me to do more than just submit it in writing twenty four hours in advance. So I, I think we're kind of, this is where we have multiple meetings talking about the same thing. <laughs> so, you know, um, and so that's- and Jerry, I think Can that, you say if someone wants to make public comment, they'll validate that they're who they say they are, and then you're gonna give them an invitation? Is that what you're doing so that they can join in on the meeting? So there's three options. One, we can, um, one is that they can they can submit in writing 24 hours in advance or even even right up there too but guaranteed 24 hour in advance with the language that the problem is is that the day of if you guys are this you guys are the second meeting if someone did anything between five and seven you know i was on another meeting so i could facilitate that my my staff is at home and they're not you know unless we're going to pay them to work in the evenings you know that kind of stuff you know that kind of, so there's there's these weird kind of quirks to it so anyways they can submit in writing um I'm trying to find a way to do an audio recording where they can leave a recorded message and that can be played, can be previewed and played. The other one is someone could be invited to, to, to be invited in if they wanted to speak. Um, and quite frankly, they could be invited in, they could speak, and then we could actually dismiss them from the meeting after the call to comment is over, and then they can join on the streaming live right now. So something like that. That way, if someone says, you know, I really would, you know. You know, you're imagining if someone's going to go through the effort to wanting to speak here, they're going to be on some, hopefully, a solid subject of something that we're discussing. Um, you know, public comment goes up and down depending on what's going on. We have you know months with nothing, and then twenty. You know, so yeah, so that's so, kind of the plan moving forward. And then at the same time, if technology improves, um, we'll be able to modify it again. We'll have you guys change the policy yet again. So. Yeah, I, I'm I'm kind of understanding what Sunderland's objection to the 24 hours in advance. Um, you know, our our committee times, like uh, Sunderland was at 5:30 today, we're at seven. So, you know, the public would get a later time. I don't know. Maybe if it's just like by noon of the meeting day or something, just like a hard stop. Um, All right. I mean, I can do by. I can do by. I can even do. Greater than I can do by by, by three o'clock the day of, that gives us enough time to review it because before the day yeah. over, the work day's over here. Yeah. yeah. So, but I, I appreciate all the effort on this. So, Michael, j Michael, just so you know that, in, in in the frontier meeting last week, I was I was a big proponent of asking Darius to do something more than, um, you know, just as he's talking about is that you know, be, because I I. My, my, my take on all this is that the big the big enemy of us as school committee members is apathy and that when you do get that person that the the, the resident that's willing that, that has a comment and you put hurdles in front of that person and you make it harder for them to participate that that's that's bad for us all um, and you know especially since most of the time we we don't get much participation from the public. So, so I, I you know, I, I'm a big proponent of as close to unfettered access and, and, you know, welcoming public participation as we possibly can, because I think it's in all of our best long-term interests. So, well, except we're talking that's, short that's term. That's a great here. point, Phil. Well, I mean, if you think about what Phil's saying, you know, it, Sometimes a hurdle is being on a, a 
a meeting at 7.15 at night, but if I could make my comment at, you know, nine in the morning and ensure that it's read for me, um, that actually opens up access as opposed to, I have to be at a meeting at 7.15 during the public comment before it closes. Yeah, that's actually a hurdle in and of itself. This is true. Good point. This is true. I like Darius's way of phrasing it, though, and I'm all in favor of the short-term solution and then the slightly more medium-term better solution. Um, because their whole sure. point was to try to undermine confidence in this remote learning and this remote meeting and all that by, you know, dropping that, you know. I mean, I'm sure parents who we're at that meeting now we're like, oh my God, my kid could be in a second grade lesson and get, you know, porn streaming on his, his computer. You know, that would be terrifying. You know, right. just, just, just for those watching, um, the, it's very different. <laughs> the, uh, the school classrooms, um, Google platform, you can only be, if you're invited in with the school accounts and those, it's only those students can get in. So even parents can't get into those classrooms unless they're invited in directly. So just one page. I don't want that kind of general fear out there. Dr. Campbell, I don't like uh, you're sending fear out <laughs> in the community. Um, and, I, and I try to, uh, and it, it, we, it's a very different than when we send a Google link out to the world and we say, please come join us for our meeting versus these very closed things where, um, you know, that really cannot happen. Right. I'm just saying that was part of the point of them doing that was to undermine confidence. Yeah, I think it's also not, just not that they could do it, but that right. that, you know, that that they were seeking to cause trouble. Yeah. So. Um, so you have a series of um, you have two other um, policies that have to be voted tonight in, in doing to do so, you need to waive in your policy for um, for policy adoption, the school committee may dispense with the above sequence to meet emergency conditions. And that is the double reading. So that we read it one meeting, we vote at the next meeting. You have three um, things, the other two tonight. So you have the public comment that we need to update so that we can do it the next meeting. You have face coverings, which I need you to adapt so that we can have the first day of school. Um, where students are coming back and we have a policy in place to support face coverings. And then the last one, the last one is about remote learning, which is we're probably already late in the sense of adopting a remote learning policy that just kind of does the overall outline of, you know, um, our goals and strategies for um, remote learning, making sure that all people are involved, that it's not exclusionary in our practices and that such. So those are the three that you have to do. So what I'm recommending is that you first move, make a motion to waive um, the policy adoption to do a single reading and vote tonight. So moved. So moved. You, gotta, you need a second. You got to do a roll call vote of that. Can I have a second? Second. I'll second it. All right. And uh, Denise, you approve of this? Yes. Ashley? Yes. Phil? Yes. Michael? Yes. And I approve also. So it's unanimous that we will not need a second reading. And can we vote all policies together? You can vote all three together. So I did just do a quick run over, but if you had a chance to go through them, the face covering policy just basically is a policy about what our rules are around mask use at school. And again, the remote learning policy, um, it just basically gives us a structure that we have to follow for, which we already built around using this, this kind of these language and, and such, but it holds us to it, so. All righty, can I have a motion to approve these three policies? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor of these three policies, uh, Denise? Yes. Ashley? Yes. Phil? Yes. Michael? Yes. And I approve of these three policies. So they all pass unanimously. Excellent. The only thing you have left now are committee reports. I mean, uh, the, the chair report, collateral report, principal report, and superintendent report. I believe Kristen gave us hers in her update. Uh, is there a collaborative report, Michael? Um, the collaborative last meeting I attended um they are 
addressing some budgetary concerns. Um, they're still offering uh, classes. They're, um, they're still working with all the districts. There's oh, um, the executive director is retiring and they're doing a new executive director search. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. There's a lot going on at the collaborative, um, but uh, it's still under good hands and we'll go. That's not an easy task to find an executive director to handle that. But I, right. I thought that executive director, I thought that executive director was excellent. Yeah. Um, and, and I especially Bill, appreciate Bill Deal is an amazing that, person. Yeah. Yeah, and I, the, his ability and willingness to attempt to um, affect public discussions about education issues with frequent editorials and is very well written. Um, but he, he really got himself out there, um, and I think that our, we're going to miss him. Yeah, no, he's he was very hard, tough act to follow. He will be. Um, I do not have a report. Is Darius? Do you have anything? No. All righty. Uh, so do we need to go into executive session? Nope, that oh, was just there. If you, Oh, we did. Oh, my God. We almost didn't vote the MOA. Oh. <laughs> oh, that's not funny. That's Glad what I happens asked. when I have five hours straight of meetings. Don't worry. I'm... You were going to catch that, Bill? I mean, the mic? Uh, All right. So the last thing you need to vote is, you know what? This is what happens when I'm running the agenda not the chair. You also need to vote the memorandum of agreement. This is what we were discussing in the executive session. We couldn't return to vote. Um, you do have an executive session if you really wanted to go back and talk about it more, but I think we did. We finished our discussion on it at that, that joint meeting. So um, that's Can just, I have a motion for the to approve the memorandum of understanding? Darius, can I just ask you a question before you go on? And the, temp yep. the template that Donna gave me um, and I'm, I'm happy to cross this out. I just wanted to make sure you knew, because I know you've been doing a lot of meetings. On the template that Donna gave me, it has you going into executive session to take the vote and then coming back out. No. Okay. All right. Just want to make sure. We went to, it's just there in case we had to go into. Um, okay. It's not on the agenda I'm looking at, so and that's okay. not how we did it the last three times. So okay, all right. It's just memorandum to sure. agreement, the working condition and changes for the 2020-2021 school year between the Teachers 38 Union 38 Teachers Association, Instructional <laughs> Association, and the Conway School Committee. All righty. Can I have a motion to approve that? I'll make a motion to approve the memorandum of agreement. Second. Second. All righty. Uh, uh, let me see. Denise? Yes. Ashley? Yes. Phil? Yes. Michael? And I yes. approve it also, so it is unanimous. All righty. So now I need a motion to adjourn the meeting. Can, can I get a motion to adjourn the meeting? Yes. So moved. Second. All right. Second. Second. All in favor? I'll second it. Yes. All right. Yes. That's a wrap. <laughs>